So hello everybody. Um, to those of you I haven't met, I'm Jane Mumford and I'm part of the development team at Murray Edwards College. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Gavin Stevenson, who's a research fellow in sociology. Um, Gavin began studying in Cambridge in 2011 and his undergraduate dissertation, dissertation was an ethnographic study with drag queens in Barnsley. His MPhil thesis was a brief exploration of narrative accounts of being offended with Cambridge students. Um, the, th the phenomenon and feeling of being offended is now the focus of his PhD project. Gavin's other passions also include um, outreach and widening participation work. He's involved in several such projects with the University of Cambridge Admissions Office and other groups where he teaches on representations of gender and sexuality in the media and popular culture. This evening he'll be focusing on how everyday microaggressions can form part of macro grievances. So thank you very much and over to you Gavin. Great. Um, so thank you very much for joining me this evening. As has been said, I'm Gavin Stevenson. I've been a fellow in sociology at Murray Edwards College for this is my fourth year here, um, having previously been a student, undergraduate and postgraduate at Fitzwilliam College since 2011. So this is year 11 of Cambridge um, for me. The ideas that I'm going to draw upon come largely from my PhD study on the phenomenon and feeling of being offended. And it's a very, the PhD was a very personal project for me, having always been cast as someone who was oversensitive or too easily offended. I was particularly interested in what this characterization does when it's announced, when somebody is described as oversensitive. And I entered into that research, um, so the PhD started in 2014-15, uh, a time of increased scrutiny, which continues today, of the supposed hypersensitivity of young people, of millennials, but particularly um, university students, myself amongst them, who were characterised as catastrophizing small instances or being a generation of snowflakes unable to deal with the realities of social life or otherwise being too politically correct, which might then have implications for how we think about issues such as free speech. So one of the things I've been particularly focused on within my research and what I'm going to talk about today is the exploration of what are contemporarily termed microaggressions and how microaggressions function to shape social life for marginalised and minority social subjects. So my research broadly aims to explore the enduring, continual and at times perhaps seemingly banal ways that inequalities get reproduced and within this vi violence is so often conceptualized as exceptional a spectacular or clearly visible moment of harm to a particular body and sometimes it certainly is there are visible and apparent violences in society yet i want to suggest that the reading of violence as only exceptional as only spectacular or clear or visible, um, severely hinders our ability to understand how inequality is reproduced. So the term microaggression, um, as I explore it, will become a lens to highlight the repetitive, continuous and enduring ways that inequalities are reproduced at the level of ordinary or everyday behaviours. Um, and how this process of everyday and ongoing repetition is one of the insidious ways that inequality is reproduced. So today I want to discuss a couple of examples of microaggressions to highlight the complexity embedded within the phenomenon, but suggest that in changing the way we hear or receive grievance might productively push us to think about how we might intervene in the reproduction of inequality more broadly. So let's start with a little bit of definition. So microaggression as a term um, was actually coined in the 1970s as a way of thinking about how racism is reproduced. But 
takes up popularity much more recently um, as a kind of burgeoning field of study, the study of microaggressions, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years, and is usually now associated with the psychologist Derald, um, Derald Wing Su. Um, and the definition of microaggression that Sue gives is the brief, commonplace, daily verbal, behavioural and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory or negative racial, gender and sexual orientation and religious slights and insults to the targeted person or group. Now, what's so important in the above is the ability to spot microaggressions um, or what, what can become difficult is the ability to spot microaggressions, the supposed invisibility of them, who do they appear for, who understands them, and who doesn't understand them, basically. Um, and I want to talk about these four broad problems that come with understanding microaggressions. And I want to give you some examples of what might be a microaggression and how we can think about this as a product of a social and historical relationship rather than an individual's oversensitivity to something. Um, so let me start by um giving an giving an example um from my own experience as an undergraduate at cambridge um the first example um this example i was sat in a kitchen in the kitchen with my housemate um who i'm going to call courtney for the purposes of this not not her real name um courtney and i had been living together for a month or so at this point friends but still kind of getting to know one another at this point so we were sat chatting having a cup of tea and part way through the conversation courtney asked the following question so gavin i've been wondering why are gay people more promiscuous her tone is one of genuine and earnest interest now at this point in the conversation i have a decision to make and I need to make it quickly. The question immediately strikes me as both unfair and inappropriate. Despite the tone of earnest interest and the manner that it's an attempt, however misguided, to understand me better, or rather to understand me as a gay man, um, there are two basic assumptions that have been made in asking that question that I received as deeply problematic. One, Courtney has assumed that the reality is that gay people are more promiscuous than presumably heterosexual people are. Two, the second problematic assumption is that I, as one gay man, have the authority to speak on behalf of all gay people and diagnose or explain why the group behaves in this way. Importantly, in this kind of kitchen drama, let's call it, it's not the first time I've been asked a question of this nature, um, kind of over the course of my life. And I approached answering this question as calmly and compassionately as possible. My response, tried ever so delicately to explain that the question was inappropriate along the lines of what I just said. So what followed, I said, Courtney, I'm not sure that's an appropriate question because it assumes X and Y. After a very brief recounting of these points about the assumptions that are embedded in the question, Courtney responded by becoming clearly upset. She almost instantly started crying she exclaimed, you know I don't mean it like that. I'm not homophobic. I'm just trying to get to know you better. Why are you making this about something political? Now, importantly, Courtney is still a friend today, but I couldn't tell you honestly whether or not they remember this particular incident. 
But what I want to highlight from this is some of those common issues with microaggressions that I'd listed in the previous slide. So let's go back to that slide. What I want to highlight is how that conversation for me as a gay man existed on quite a different level to what it appeared to exist in or the reality it existed in for Courtney. And through Co Courtney's defensive reaction, we might learn a few things about how this conversation operated on different levels for us. In terms of the invisibility and unintentional bias, first, it's not clear to Courtney that her question demonstrates a bias in the first place. Yet to me, there's a quick, clear presupposition of a homophobic trope that gay people are more promiscuous. In terms of the perceived minimal harm, she asked me why I'm making this about something beyond her individual and seemingly innocent question, deriving from her sense of attempting to know gay people and by extension me better. So she doesn't really understand why this trope might be harmful or why I might take personal offence at this. But there's also a catch-22 in responding to this. And it, we might explain this um, problem in terms of what Sarah Ahmed calls the killjoy effect. Within this situation, I'm perceived to be a killjoy by calling out the behaviour. So I become the origin of the discomfort within that conversation for Courtney by bringing up my grievance or issue with her. So my calling out of an offensive behaviour becomes considered the source of pain in the room. Despite my very soft tone, I was perceived as aggressive for bringing up my pain. Importantly, I never called her homophobic within the conversation, but she takes this as a personal attack on her character and thus feels compelled to reject my understanding of what that question meant. So this is to say, kind of, no matter how delicately you sometimes point out that somebody's done something inappropriate, you can't really win. You're still considered unreasonable for having brought it up. Then, finally, we might end with what we call a clash of sexual realities. So for me, this conversation is operating on multiple levels. I suggest that this isn't the first time I've received such a question about the supposed promiscuity of gay people in relation to straight people. I had an understanding from my own embodied experience that these gay stereotypes about gay men exist and that Courtney's question was deploying this sexual trope. Courtney, on the other hand, um, in this case, Courtney is a straight woman. Courtney does not have this particular lived experience or capacity to see this incident instantly through the lens of homophobia. This is to say, our positions within this conversation weren't equal. We understand the same words or same question through very different lenses in relation to our embodied experience of the world. And I'll return to these ideas after, but I wanna think about a second example before I give some wider reflections on this. Um, and this second example might be for some mod with a little bit more ambiguity um, in terms of trying to grasp what was at stake. So, Maya um, describes herself when I interview her as a young woman of colour and she uses the term brown to describe herself as well, which is quite important for this story. The context of the story, and I'll give you some full quotations from her, but Maya is essentially waiting for a friend just outside of the Trinity Porter's Lodge, on the inside of the college, and she's a student at another, co uh, another college. She's approached by the porter. In their exchange about what Maya is doing there, he justifies asking her for her college card as proof of ID by saying, well, I don't want any bombs going off here. So let me give you the full, um, full account of her, um, of her story. So this is a full quotation from Maya. 
if people say something to me, I get really defensive. So my reaction is also defense. And so I think that comes a lot from taking offense. I walk to Trinity College and I'm waiting for a friend. I'm waiting for a friend and basically your friend has to come and pick you up from Trinity Porter's Lodge because they don't just let the riffraff walk around. I walk in and my phone dies and I sit on the steps of Trinity and I go to message her on my laptop. And the porter goes, excuse me, are you a member of Trinity? And I go, no, I'm a member of Corpus. He's like, well, Corpus is that way. And I'm like, well, I'm aware where Corpus is, but I'm waiting for a friend at Trinity. And again, I'm already on the defensive because, the tone he, because of the tone he's taken with me. So I'm quite rude back to him. I'm like, I'm waiting for a friend. And he's like, well, you're supposed to show us your card. And I'm like, there are a lot of likes in this, um, in this piece. And I'm, um, and I'm like, well, I wasn't aware. And he's like, well, you just walked in and sit down. How am I supposed to know? And I just look at him. And he goes, well, I don't want any bombs going off here. And I went, excuse me. And he went, uh. And I said, I can assure you, I don't have any bombs on me. And he said, how can I be sure of that? And I said, you can check my bag if you like. And then um, I think my first emotion is, I'm going to cry, but I do not want to cry in front of this man and embarrass myself. And then I think the offense was tied into this. I think the offense started with him first being like quite abrupt and rude to me. And then the girl behind me, who happened to be white, she was offered a seat in the Porter's Lodge. And he was like, are you waiting for someone or are you just sitting down to the white girl? He didn't offer me a seat. He didn't ask me if I was waiting for someone. And I think the offense is tied into that. And the offense is tied into, and she pauses, this is racial, and she laughs a little. You don't know it's racial, but it's racial. You can't just ask people if they're carrying bombs. Um, so yeah, I was really offended and also really hurt. And like, I remember just being like, I am going to cry, but I cannot cry right now. So that's the end of the long quotation. Maya mentions her disposition of being defensive at the beginning of the encounter. As a result of his tone, she tells me that she's rude back to her, him, displaying, displayed in her shortness of response. And then there's a shift in emotional register midway through the encounter. After the porter justifies his line of inquiry with reference to the possibility of bombs going off, Maya tells me that she begins to want to cry. She mentions the importance of not crying in front of this man. Crying would lead to a feeling of embarrassment. Beyond her initial description, Maya highlights the favourable and hospitable treatment of the white girl who entered the lodge after her. At this point, Maya brings in a frame to understand and interpret the event, that this is racial. After her brief pause and laugh, she delivers a very complex statement. You don't know it's racial, but it's racial. Whilst it's first a seemingly paradoxical or contradictory statement, I think it provides a very useful way to think about the manner in which we might be able to differentially experience reality. Indeed, we might ask what conditions foreclose the possibility for Maya of seeing the event as anything other than racially charged. To understand the racialized nature of the encounter requires examining how Maya connects events narratively and affectively or emotionally. When analysing this particular interview, the manner in which evidence was used to build the case relied on a particular kind of sticking and patching together of multiple accounts of racism happening in multiple places. So let me turn to some examples of this. So um, I've given you some highlights of the quotes here, but I'll read some slightly longer quotations again, because I think Maya expresses things in a remarkably kind of clear way often. So Maya, for example, said, I think the nail on the head for me was the white girl behind me. 
I think the offense maybe came partly from my own guilt that I'd done something wrong. Maybe that's not offense, maybe that's just guilt. Maybe because I sat down and I took up so much space, he has a right to talk to me like this. Or maybe I'd done something wrong and I doubt. So I was thinking a lot about all of these things. But I think the big thing is, um, I think offense is maybe like the big one. And I think I'm not just offended on my behalf, but I'm offended on behalf of like all the people of color at Cambridge. It's like, there are networks of women of color in Cambridge. And I read about stuff like this all the time. So it was like offense on a structural level. So to finish that quote, what becomes significant for Maya is the way that this event is considered not a singular action, not a singular unique encounter with the porter, but as stuff like that, which happens to people of color at Cambridge. The testimonies of other people of color having encountered similar things, as well as her status as a social science student, allows her or indeed compels her to interpret the event as a racialized or racist encounter. Further, in a list of words Maya gave to characterize this event, amongst the feeling of offense, guilt and hurt, she mentions the word representative. And she says, I think that representative, representative of a larger structure. So like, I remember on the day after the Paris attacks being really afraid to go outside because I'm not Muslim, but people who are like prejudiced against people with my skin color, that's not going to make a difference. And I think that's what I mean by representative. I think that he was somehow representing his race and I was somehow representing mine. So to draw a kind of similarity to my own example, what myself and Maya both kind of try and articulate is that it feels like something more is going on that the other person can't see. Further, Maya's own sense of injury is patched together as a kind of collective wound, which intensifies the affectivity of the encounter on reflection. She says, to quote her again, I think knowing that this fits into a wider context was both reassuring and pretty sad, that it isn't just me. And this is a really key thing. If that incident didn't happen in the context of it happening to a lot of other people, it wouldn't have been an incident, if that makes sense. In the moment, it was deeply personal, but in hindsight, I can now extrapolate that to be uh, this is an experience for a lot of people. This is the way a lot of people are treated. So Maya's description of the encounter quickly became, on reflection, an archetypal encounter about the racialized dynamics of belonging expressed through encounters with the porters as symbolic or institutional gatekeepers. The encounter becomes archetypal in the way that it represents something beyond the immediacy of the encounter. It represents a broader structure or way of thinking about race. So Maya argues that the encounter becomes an incident by way of it being a repetition of a character of behaviours and dynamics. Now, what I want to draw from these two examples of microaggressions, that kind of um, reaction about bombs or the use of the threatening image of somebody with a bomb within that conversation or the articulation of the question why are gay people more promiscuous is I want to draw out a few points of how microaggressions come to matter symbolically and materially how do they come to be understood as acts of everyday violence and injury and how or when do these moments of grievance actually potentially produce something beyond the encounter itself? Whether in my own example or the conversation with, um, my own example of the conversation with Courtney or Maya's encounter with the porter, the situations represented something clearly in excess of the immediate words that were spoken. In both stories, the repetitive nature of the injury is highlighted in some way. For Maya, 
It matters that people she identifies as like herself have similar experiences of being stopped by the porters, or that her skin colour is associated societally with the image of the terrorist. This facilitates or even compels her to interpret the event as clearly about race. And this is confirmed by her comparison to the relatively favourable treatment of the white girl. This is to say it matters or makes sense to Maya as a racialized encounter in the context of other experiences, both personal and collective, that are undercut by racialized dynamics. This is deeply felt. The comment about bombs makes her want to cry. Without recourse to thinking about the, how the comment operates within a wider system of race and racialization, Maya indeed might be understood as oversensitive or too easily offended. But I would argue that this attributes too much agency to the person who suffers a microaggression, as if they're willfully interpreting a situation in a particular way, as if they themselves are fixated on race, much like I might have been accused of being overly fixated on homophobia in my conversation with Courtney. But what's important in both examples is how these singular moments come to represent something of an ongoing pattern. The pattern is seen by the person who is injured through their repeated experience of the dynamic or similar kinds of social dynamics, but for that very reason often is not recognised by the person who might flippantly use a phrase or ask a question. Their lack of embodied experience with the phenomenon means that the words operate within a different kind of reality. So why is this important when thinking about microaggressions and then violence or inequality more broadly? With all of my interview participants, um, the first question I always ask them, or the reason they came to talk to me, was to answer the question, can you tell me about a time in which you were offended? So the interviews were based around the idea of telling me about a single incident in which they were offended. But very quickly, so many of my participants quickly made reference to other sources of offence, which would contextualise their feeling in one particular moment. Throughout interviewing, I ended up finding the theme of repetition, the continual wearing or continual enduring of things like microaggressions as a key feature when people recount the emotional impact of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, classism, and so forth. Now, when we highlight the continual and ongoing as the site of violence, rather than just thinking about vi the violences of racism, sexism, and homophobia as singular and spectacular moments, I want to suggest it requires we think about the response to injury in different ways as well. Not simply as an individual act to be called out or punished, but as something rather more complex. So I want to offer a few kind of brief thoughts to then try and wrap up and then open this to a broad discussion. What I want to really get across here, if I can express something as a take home message from a rather long series of quotes, is that the feeling of racism, sexism and homophobia is complex because so much of the feelings expressed are unlikely to be um, intelligible through com conventional mechanisms. So if we think about something, um, something like a complaints procedure, it might seem like a waste of time to complain about a particular incident, because that incident or moment of racism is only understood as racist through its connection to a wider series of events. So how do you make a complaint about a general culture of racism 
Also then, often things like microaggressions are dismissed as trivial, which they might seem trivial if they're understood as um, specific and individual instances. Yet, as Maya tells us, the incidents of racism only become racist, uh, understood as racist in relation to an archive of feelings which is collectively discussed by others. So, often we focus on the moment rather than all of the collection of experiences that allow us to understand the texture or the real feeling of racism. And I think there are a few great quotes that might illustrate some of this. So um, that there's an old adage here that I've um, popped on. It's not the mountains ahead that wear you down, but the grains of sand in your shoes. Similarly, Sue describes the effect of microaggressions may be compared to the perennial slow death by a thousand cuts that each of those individual injuries might seem trivial, but it's precisely their cumulative effect that, um, that leads them to endure. So what finally I want to um, kind of think about as these concluding points is that the micro and microaggression is not a judgment about the level of harm caused by the microaggression, Rather, it refers to the difficulties in seeing or expressing this as an injury because other people might think about it as trivial or not mattering or an individual event. But microaggressions are about a relationship of ongoing and everyday manifestations of violence, which become cumulative. And this is the really important part of the picture about microaggressions, that microaggressions exist within a wider economy of violences, that it's not just about the single incident, that the single incident becomes known in relation to its continual pattern of repetition. So it's the cumulative nature of microaggressions as a product of this dispersed repetition. Anybody can be doing these microaggressions or repeating them, even if they're good people or woke people. Um, and the, this culmination of experiences, of micro-experiences, gives us an understanding of the experience of discrimination or a toxic cultural working environment. So to dismiss microaggressions as minimal or trivial um, in their harm limits our ability to understand and hear the embodied, real, and lived experiences of marginalized people and minorities more broadly. So if we're not willing to understand how the trivial or the seemingly singular incidents add up to a wider network or picture, we have a very limited understanding of how these inequalities are reproduced at the everyday level. So I'll stop um, there, so we can um, we can open it up for discussion. Um, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Gavin. That was really really interesting. Um, can I just invite um, all the people who are listening to put your questions in via the chat? Um, we're recording this, and we will make it available, but we can't have you on screen, um, all the participants on screen as well. So please do put um, any questions you have into the chat. Um, I've got a question to start us off, which is, in your research, have you particularly focused on students in Cambridge, or does, mm -hmm. your, does your net of people you've interviewed go much wider than that? So I focus specifically on students at the University of Cambridge. Um, that was, um, originally I was going to do a comparative um, study with another university. What I quickly found was, because so much of the experience of offence relies on a, a deep understanding of the context, it was useful to stick with Cambridge as something that I was incredibly familiar with as a context, um, so I could understand um, what people were talking about more broadly within the context of this institution, and then really focus on some of my recommendations to be tailored to 
institutional reform here. Okay. So in addition to recommendations for institutional reform, if you if a particular incident like the girl and the porter's lodge yeah. is identified, do you would you report for want of a better um, phrase mm. that as an incident that really ought to be addressed with the individual and with within that particular college? Yeah. So interestingly, so I, I did um, a total of 40, 45 interviews and some of the um in all cases i always um one offered confidentiality to the kind of participant that mm. their stories wouldn't go anywhere without their permission but i also asked when it was clear that um a form of harassment or discrimination had taken place so in examples that were much clearer than say Maya's example might initially have been. Um, I offered to advocate on behalf of students and help them go through an official complaints procedure. Not one of them wanted to. Okay. And I was interested in why people didn't want to bring up kind of their complaints. For instance, one participant, Nadia, who within an hour interview told me about 32 discrete instances of racism that she'd experienced in her then one and a half years at Cambridge. Um, I asked her, do you want to report any of this? And she say, said, what's the point? If you try and report these things, you're just sitting, this is to paraphrase her, sitting across from a sea of old white men who aren't going to understand or take you seriously. So why would I put myself through that? And I think that kind of fatalism tells us something, something quite important about how, um, how there's this wider problem or gap in what we might call understanding. It's very resonant of the argument that René Edo Lodge makes in why are no longer talking to white people about race, that people might not be willing to hear um, hear grievance. So it was, it was deeply troubling um, that nobody wanted to take these things forward and some were clearly quite egregious cases of institutional racism, sexism and homophobia. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at the uh, other questions in the, um, in the chat as well. Um, so in terms of so thanks very much for your question joanna do you have any suggestions for more constructive complaints procedures which understand microaggressions in their context i think it becomes a really um it's incredibly difficult um but one project that i would highlight that's currently ongoing by the sociology department not something that i'm personally involved in um but something that I'm looking at with great interest is the End Everyday Racism Project. Now, what that project seeks to do as a mode of data collection is not in the first instance linked directly to complaints procedures, but is attempting to collect data that might fall outside of a usual complaints procedure in understanding the experience of racism. So for instance, it has boxes that allow somebody to describe, um, describe their experience of, um, of racism through a series of disparate or interconnected, um, interconnected events, and also tries to map out where these things happen um, but also encourages people to also write about those situations that might be on the whole much more ambiguous that other people might not instantly register as racist now while this data in and of itself isn't necessarily a solution to the problem of complaints procedures what it might um might highlight um is how we need to think about things like racism not just as individual events that need to be discreetly punished so the idea of 
the problem of racism in university is the nasty old racist person who if we get rid of then the institution is fixed so the kind of bad apple model of racism now of course those people do exist but what we want to think about is how racism is a phenomenon that's produced culturally in excess of individual intention and if that's the case then complaints procedures aren't the only place to think about intervening it might be giving people more of a platform or a series of languages to be able to express their experience even for instance having the term microaggression itself can be hugely empowering in the sense that if part of the phenomenon is a constant self-doubt am i just making something out of nothing having a language to say actually this is a pattern can in and of itself be a really useful tool for people to articulate their experience so essentially i'm weaseling out and saying i'm unfortunately don't have a vision of what a better complaints procedure would be yet um but it's something i'm constantly thinking about and where i want to push parts of my research next uh, so thanks for the question sorry i couldn't really actually properly answer um answer it um is there a both and perspective that could be brought to the porter incident how should the porter more effectively discharge his responsibility to maintain security whilst also preserving the dignity of people of color within the university absolutely so i think with um with this particular um particular incident um what's interesting is maya is at first doubtful or she is questioning kind of is this actually kind of about race or maybe maybe he does or does have that right to ask me why i'm why i'm there because i'm not a member um it's precisely in relation to a few other things that she's able to identify that this clearly is a form of mistreatment so for instance the favorable kind of um would you like a seat to the um to the white um woman as well as then the kind of flippant use of the language of um of bombs what i think is important in managing kind of the security of the college um more broadly is to ask or be critical of who appears as a stranger to the institution and the pattern that's usually brought up by students of color across the university is that more often than not it's students of color that are automatically considered or thought to not belong and that this comes often in very unconscious ways of stopping those students of color in a way that white students are automatically read as students rather than um tourists so i think it's or tourists or people who don't actually attend the university so what i would say is the real problem is that if if one is supposed to check the kind of the cards of anybody who comes in clearly that's not a policy that is being applied to everyone so i think it, it's a question of the policy of checking students cards needs to be applied either unilaterally or not at all um and i think that's um that's the way to think about it that if there is a policy in place then it really should be a policy for everyone um so the next question did you look into unconscious bias training um i don't know if anyone in the university offers it um but i took part in it and it was some of the best induction training i've ever had so it helped me understand what i had personally experienced but also the experience of others so absolutely i'm particularly um particularly interested in different kinds of training that the university um does offer 
Um, I think unconscious, um, unconscious bias training is a really good kind of starting point for me for the discussion to try and acknowledge that there might be something beyond my intention as an individual that's being re reproduced um even if i don't want to even if i see myself as a really progressive person and i think one of the one of the quite pernicious um conceptualizations of racism or sexism or homophobia that exists today is that the racist or the homophobe or the sexist is an exceptional and bad and or stupid individual who does individual bad things like using the n-word or whatever it might be and that very kind of stereotype of the individual bad person doing bad things actually becomes a mechanism which helps to reproduce racism so if we think about my example with my housemate Courtney it was so important for her that she reject my understanding of the event because she she was not homophobic and any suggestion that she could be homophobic really challenged her kind of moral sense of value and place in the world and i think it's what um robin d'angelo might refer to as fragility in terms of people often aren't willing to kind of accept or think about how if you live in a society that's historically been racist or colonialist for hundreds of years then you're still living in the legacy of those ideas so of course you're going to reproduce some of these ideas but it's then about what we what we do with that information so i think unconscious bias training then is a great place to get that conversation going and think about there's something that exists below the level of intention so i need to kind of be thinking about that but then the next steps i think beyond unconscious bias training are then once you've identified you might have biases what then do you do with that and how do you work on um work on yourself and work on your capacity to listen to the stories of others without going to that very defensive place um and i think that's a much trickier and ongoing project of kind of working on yourself um in relation to others um so thanks very much for that courtney yeah so <clears throat> liz thank you for your question so courtney genuinely didn't think she was doing anything wrong and was upset and pointed it out whose responsibility is it to educate courtney should that be done kind of um in schools or in other other places basically and i think this is part of the dynamics of the catch-22 because i if i wanted an easier life within that situation i could have just flippantly answered her question in some way and said oh i don't know um just because they are or whatever but the problem then is i feel a kind of social responsibility to point out that something homophobic happened there in order to not feel that i'm enabling her to do this to somebody else so there's a level of unfair let's call it social responsibility on the person who suffers the injury often feeling obligated to defend other people that are like themselves and that's that's a pernicious and kind of ex extended form of labor you might have to do as a minority which it shouldn't really be on you necessarily to have to do that because the emotional impact of the thing is then also exacerbated by having to having to chat about it right um so i think absolutely i would always suggest more should be done in kind of ph se lessons um but bro more broadly on curriculums just for instance the conversations we have about decolonizing the curriculum or 
in a lot of cases, diversifying curriculum to have um, more diverse voices in general and more diverse experiences taught um, taught in liter through literature or history would be a good way of trying to kind of get people at a younger age to think about you might see the world quite differently from other people. Um, I don't, I get a sense that that's not the way the national curriculum is going at the minute um, in terms of some of the hostility to things like critical race theory that exists at the kind of ministerial or wider governmental level. Um, so I'm, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I would love to see a kind of a more comprehensive education about, um, about identity and kind of positionality, but I'm not going to hold my breath for it in the immediate term, um, unfortunately. Um, I find it useful. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point to the kind of the idea of the kind of who we see as a stranger or a potential danger is not a kind of an innocent thing. And then recognizing ourselves that that um, that, yeah, we see or we read bodies differently beyond our intention. Um, that's very true and conscious. Mm, it's working. In Yeah, I think, um, yeah, thanks very much for that kind of reflection from working in secondary education. Um, I think if I remember my own experiences of PESHE or whatever the kind of acronym was at that time, because I think famously it, they changed the acronym every couple of years um, or did, was that it it was considered something that was a kind of flippant extra that you did every couple of weeks. The same with citizenship education, a kind of a chore that gets in the way of real learning when I think it really didn't ought to be this notion of understanding and relating to others and finding languages and ways to share experience and diverse perspectives didn't ought to be, for me, considered this supplementary kind of education that, oh, we have to talk about diversity once every every couple of weeks, it's a bit of a chore. I think it really did ought to be integrated more fully across elements of the curriculum, but I suspect at the minute, um, and maybe you can tell me whether my assumption is right or wrong in the chat, that it relies on kind of the having a particularly good or keen teacher who might be quite literate in ideas around race and gender delivering that rather than that being something that's necessarily expected um, because it's about more than just being a kind of good person um, mm, yeah absolutely so you're kind of if you're very limited by um, limited by time as well, then you're trying to essentially fight a ton of different fires um, with such limited resources. And I think that's a real <coughs> that's a real shame. That's one of the reasons I'm particularly interested in doing more outreach work. Part of my outreach work, like teaching about representations of gender in the media, is getting students to engage in an academic and ongoing project, so developing research skills, but then my social justice element of it, if you, uh, if you like, is to also use that as a mechanism to just create space for those conversations. Um, and I think that's quite important for them. Mm. It would stand. Mm. Whether employed, it would stand a chance. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sue, thank you for your comment. Um, I think it might depend hugely on how it's phrased and if the wording you you just use were employed, it would stand a ch mm. So yeah, often these kind of conversations do come across, I think, as quite as quite divisive because they are uncomfortable conversations often to happen. I mean, it is often so bound up in this moral language of racism equals kind of being a bad person, um, which is not in and of itself the most useful way to think about it, to think about this as just individual things. I think if we can collectively work on a on a much more relational and structural language about these things, that sounds terribly abstract, probably, but trying to find ways to try and decenter essentially the hurt feelings of the injurer, as it were, that it's not like you don't need to make somebody else's complaint about you in the first instance. And that's often a really hard thing to kind of accept or do or to be quiet. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, so for instance, Black History about that, um, yeah, I think historically often, certainly from my own education, race was an American issue and class was a British issue. We didn't have a problem with, um, with race or we don't really think about race as something that is embedded within British society in the same way, which is a nonsense given our kind of colonial history, um, but is interesting to think, um, think about why there's certain absences in being able, or gaps in that literacy of being able to communicate effectively about, about race. Um, and I think also I'm a very big advocate of um, kind of doing broader diversity training and having um, creating spaces to facilitate ongoing discussion. I also think that those, I think the tricky issue is how you, how you deliver those and who you deliver them. I think one observation I often make is that a lot of the diversity training tends to be very focused on legal frameworks, um, which is obviously important to understand when has harassment and discrimination have a legal implication. But one of the other things we might think about when we understand violence as ongoing and everyday and repeated often in small ways is that then we don't necessarily want to just talk about that within a legal framework. We then want to find ways to communicate and to really be able to hear or listen to feelings as a legitimate source of evidence in and of itself. Um, and I think that so creating those spaces for discussion and taking that seriously rather than something as supplementary um so the kind of once a year they might drag you out for an hour and kind of tell you or reiterate things to you maybe making that a culture um a cultural thing that we do talk about um talk about these things more or yeah Sorry, very vague waffling at the end, uh, at the end there. Oh, sorry, I completely missed um, the others. What do you make of the likelihood that the porter... Yeah. I ask uh, why tell the woman who was disbarred. Yes, so thanks, Kate, for your question. Um, what I think, um, so I think you're quite right in terms of it's, um, so in terms of the dynamic with the porter, 
when we want to think about the situation more broadly, obviously there are multiple social dynamics going on in any given situation. Um, so there's also the dynamic of kind of um, of class. There's also going to be the dynamic of gender that's going on there with the male porter. And she particularly focused on the issue of not crying and becoming, in her words, a silly, weak looking woman. So there's always a multiplicity of quite complex things going on in any given situation. One of the one of the things it's difficult to do from Maya's interview testimony, for instance, is then to think too much about what was going through the porter's head because I didn't have access to their thoughts or their justifications about this event. And indeed, Maya didn't talk to the porter again after this. So it's hard um, for me to kind of reflect too much on, um, on that because I don't have his experience or understanding of the event. I think it would be a really kind of interesting, I don't know, a very different project to ask about, um, ask porters more broadly about their experience of how they make a decision about kind of who to stop or kind of observing that. But that would be, um, I suppose, a very different um, project. But I think, yeah, you're raising some really interesting points there, Kate. Thank you. Learning a porter, could it be constructive to think about how porter can be trained to discharge his responsibility for the... Um, great, have I missed um, any questions or...? <coughs> great. Okay, well, I suppose that's to say thank you so much for um, for coming and your questions, everyone. Um, thank you, thank you, Gavin. That's been a really interesting, really informative and uh, stimulating talk. I'm sure people will go away from it and uh, observe comments that come to them or, the, or rethink how they might phrase something to someone else in the future. Mm. So thank you very, very much. It's been really, really, really helpful. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you everybody nice for coming. Evening.